What's up everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. this is my second channel, and this is your home for my Twitch highlights and my podcast. So if you like this, and you wanna see more of that, and you wanna join the live streams, there's a link to that in the description of this video. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. Our first song is Break Stuff by Limp Biscuit. First thing we have to talk about is this snare. Um, this whole video, we're going to be playing a lot of 90s bingo. And that like cranked, super tight piccolo snare, I love those. That's why you guys, you heard my slam song earlier. <laughs> Nothing hits like one of those super cranked, tight snares. John Otto is a great drummer, by the way. And I also think this is a great video. I would say so far, this holds up. Fred Durst, as a lot of you guys may know, directed most of, if not all their videos. I think he's legitimately a really good director. You can say what you want about him being corny and you know his hats and blah, blah, blah. Um, but these videos I would say are very memorable. They held up, they were great at the time. They're still great. I think he's legitimately a really good director. It's just one of those days. What a great idea to reinforce his personal brand of having everybody in the video dressed like him. Like people recognized him for being the red hat and Dickie shorts kind of guy. And what a brilliant piece of branding to have the video mirror that. And how about the cameos in here too? Like Snoop, Dre, like this is some pretty high level shit. He was also a very good networker. Did my fucking thing just freeze? Eminem cameo. Jonathan Davis. God, this song is good. This is a great point from the chat here. Even the celebrities in the video held up to this day. That is true. Like if you had 12 celebrity cameos in a video from 1999 or 2000, how many other directors would have picked a list of 10 or 12 people that would hold up 20 years later? Like that is seriously an accomplishment. I would say this holds up completely. I think the video is great. I think the song is great. Like if you were to play this song now, like between bands at any show in any kind of rock genre, I bet people are going to mosh harder to this song than whatever band plays next. And to me, that's like always the hallmark of how good a song is. Break Stuff by Limp Biscuit. The verdict is we all agree it holds up. Stick Stickly by Attack Attack. It's actually pretty heavy. Like compared to the other crab core bands back then, that was like way heavier and way more metal than most of them. And then there's this part. I really like Johnny's hand movements there. The video is awful. The song definitely makes absolutely no sense. Like there is no structure. None of it makes any sense whatsoever. Like they go from that, you know, kind of at the gatesy part at the beginning to whatever that post hardcore part was to the mosh part here to whatever comes next. Objectively terrible songwriting. Toughest job in every one of these bands was the guy rocking out on the keyboards, just like it is for new metal. If you, if you were the guy that had to be the turntablist or the sample player, you had to work like five times harder to look cool rocking out than the guitarist. So shout out to everybody who, uh, who, who did their time in the trenches playing keyboards in a, in a crab core band. I think Caleb actually wrote the synth part in this song, didn't he? <laughs> Running in place, iconic. Yeah, there we go. Caleb rocking out. Now, another piece of trivia that probably most people know is that those are Austin Carlisle's vocals in this song. <laughs> Not Caleb's. So Caleb was the, what, third singer in Attack Attack, I think? First there was that guy, Nick, I forget his name, and then there was Austin, then there was Caleb, I think. So this is Caleb lip syncing to Austin Carlisle's screaming in this video. So far, I would say this is not holding up. I love Attack Attack. I did a whole video about them on how important they were to the scene. I think this is iconic, obviously like legendary. Love everybody in this band. They're legitimately really smart, nice, super talented people. But if I'm being honest, I would say it did not exactly hold up per se. Let's see what the... Uh, Oh, well, we're about to get to the best part of the song. I can't stop now. 
This part. I think everyone had the same experience when they first heard that, when they were like, what in the fuck is this? <laughs> Let's look at the comments here. This song is a classic now. Hate it all you want. These guys made the sound that all bands in the late 2000s did, chugging auto-tune poppy choruses and breakdowns. It's true. They did. I hope this is the only evidence that humans existed if something were to happen. Yeah. Like... Imagine it's like fallout, you know, 150 years in the future and, you know, we're digging through this time capsule and we're wondering like, what, what were people like back in uh, 2008? And this is the only evidence we have. I, I, it needs to happen. Remember kids, this is Bill Murray and Beartooth now and of Mice and Men. So think about that. Like, think about how much talent there was in this band. You know, I'm not a big fan of Austin Carlisle as a human or a musician, um, but still of Mice and Men was you know, one of the biggest bands of their genre. Beartooth is doing great. Obviously a fantastic band. Bill Murray, also super talented. So think about how much, to, and you know, also Andrew Wetzel from Attack Attack is a really smart guy too. So just think about how much talent there was in this band. So, you know, no, no surprise that it got as big as it did. I would say, although this song was iconic and legendary and changed the game, I would say it did not exactly hold up. That is that is my um, that is my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. What do you guys think? So our next song is "Pretty Fly for a White Guy" by The Offspring. I hate this song with like a burning passion. <laughs> Wallet chain, some '90s bingo. Can we just talk about the drip for a minute? Fubu with goggles over a sideways hat. Yeah, I mean, this kid would be a god on TikTok now if he showed up with that fit. I heard Weird Al's version a decade before uh, I heard of The Offspring at all. W what's funny about a song like this is like how it, it seems like it would be indistinguishable from a Weird Al parody of the song. Like, what would Weird Al even do that is more cringy than this? I have a few thoughts on this. Number one, this is a perfect example of what a friend of mine calls... Uh, GGBB, good guys, bad band. <laughs> they seem like super cool people who I would probably want to be friends with. Um, but the band is absolutely awful. Uh, and nothing that anybody can say will ever change my opinion on that. To me, this video is in song is what I would call cartoon parrot music. Meaning, can you imagine this being in a scene from some Pixar movie where there's a cartoon parrot with sunglasses on dancing to it? The answer is yes. <laughs> This is cartoon parrot music. I mean, I will say if if I have to choose between this and Stick Stickly being the only record of human existence for the aliens to find after the apocalypse, I would definitely go with Stick Stickly. <laughs> that is my choice. The singer, Dexter, he has a PhD in molecular biology. Like, he's obviously a very smart guy. How, how does someone with a PhD in biology make music this bad i don't well actually it makes perfect sense of course somebody with a phd in molecular biology is this this cringy i suppose it makes i mean this is like sheldon core right this is this is like if you had the bazinga guy make a song of course this is what he would make all right i think that's enough does this song hold up i would say yes but no as much as i personally dislike it as much as i can't stand the offspring I would say, you know, this is not a song I will ever put on one of my own playlists, but I would imagine that it's going to be on like Macy's, the playlist that they have in like the Macy's junior section forever. So, you know, you, you could say in that sense that it held up. And as long as there's movies with CG cartoon parrots being made, this song has a place. So as much as I dislike it, I might say that it holds up. I don't know. I remember my son and his friends loved this, but they were all five or six. Exactly. MGK will cover this in 2021. I really need this to happen. Yes. Here in Germany, it is still played in clubs. Uh, nothing about that surprises me. <laughs> okay, next up, we have a 2010 classic, In Friends We Trust by Chunk No Captain Chunk. Before I press play on it, can we just reflect on the fact that this song is 11 years old and how awful that is? This is the official theme song of my Twitch. After this, every hardcore adjacent band made a party party video. That is absolutely true, and I wish that those would come back. The PG-13 backyard suburban party video is one of my favorite genres, and I really wish it would come back. All these like pop punk TikTok rappers need to make a video like this. Hey, 
Wait, I gotta rewind that because I love this fill. This is like one of my favorite fills of all time, and it has a great drum sound too. Isn't that a great fill? Let's let's listen to that fill one more time. Do you think that fill was him or Easy Drummer? Well, I can tell you for sure that those are samples, whether they, you know, were placed manually or programmed, I don't know, but those are for sure samples. I will say, I think this song 100% holds up, um, but I don't know a single line in this song other than, hey dudes, are you ready to? And I've listened to this song probably literally thousands of times since it came out, and I don't know any of the actual lyrics. Um, I think the mix is really good too. Like if you listen to most this, you know, from 2010, listen to most stuff from back then. And it sounds like shit. I want to say the guitarist mixed this himself. He has a studio now. I'm pretty sure. I think that he did the original mix on this. It sounds great. This absolutely holds up. This is still a song that anybody who was around back when this came out, you play this at a show or if someone grabs hands you the ox or whatever, you play the show, every, play the song. Everybody's going to be happy. So in my book, I would say that uh, this holds up. Come Original by 311. Fucking love this band. Okay, before I get into this, we're definitely going to play some 90s bingo in this video. So, I mean, already we can see one thing, a drum rack, frosted dyed hair here, like spiky dyed hair. This guy's hand movement, I feel like is very 90s. I mean, I just frozen in this random frame and already we got like three things. And the snare, that cranked piccolo snare. Oh, look at this. This, the cowboy shirt. I, as much as I love 311, the vests and the cowboy shirt, I, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know. Yeah, the Guy Fieri shirt. He's about to take us to Flavortown. Guy, the, the white guy with dreads playing slap bass in Dickie shorts. That's definitely in the 90s bingo. This guy's a fucking good bass player, though. I will say that. Oh, I mean... This is like, this this frame right here alone is like an entire sheet of 90s bingo. The Jankos, the crop top, like the colors. This is just 1993 in one frame. I like he said, black eyed peas coming full range, whatever. No effects are coming full range. Imagine how bummed the guys and no effects were that they got a shout out from 311. Like Fat Mike was like on the phone. Can we, can we sue him for that? Also his like sort of phony dance hall accent. As much as I love 311, it's just, I mean, that the, the fake Jamaican dance hall accent is even worse than the time that Iggy Azalea tried to do that Kendrick Lamar song, which was one of the most painful things I have ever heard. The dance hall. All right. You know, I love 311. They're legitimately one of my most played artists of all time. I've been listening to them nonstop since whenever Down came out. So, you know. I legitimately do love this band, uh, but with that said, can I say that this holds up? I don't think I can. They're from Nebraska, and then I want to say they moved to San Jose, of all places. Probably because in the 90s, it didn't cost $2 million for a fucking two-bedroom house in San Jose like it does now. But imagine a rock band moving like, uh, where where should a rock band move uh, to get big? Let's go to California. Uh, how about San Jose? That sounds like a cool surf town, right? <laughs> Next up, we have The Adventure by Angels and Airwaves. Good question here. Which one would you prefer between this project and Boxcar Racer? I personally liked Boxcar Racer better, probably because that was like Tom's, like, deliberately his attempt at ripping off quicksand he like heard he talks about this in a documentary he's like oh i heard this post hardcore band called quicksand and i was like oh i want to do a band like that and then he did boxcar racer which was like blank meets quicksand i thought it was really cool i like that album a lot uh, this one's good too though I, I i would say this 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 song especially like really does feel like hopeful you know what I mean? There's just something about it that this whole album just feels hopeful. I don't know another way to use other than that. Even though they don't talk about aliens in this video, I feel like he's singing this to aliens or something. Like this was this is before we knew about the alien stuff, right? Like this is back when people still thought Tom was joking 
in Aliens Exist. I also want to know how many hollow body guitars did this album sell and how many bands were ruined because of that? Because anytime I see dudes, you know, buying hollow bodies or like Telecasters or Mustangs or Jazz Masters or anything like that, it's like, all right, you know, everything they're going to put out from now on is going to fucking suck. Angels and Airwaves is like one of the few exceptions to that. Him wearing his like NASA gear 15 years before the hype beast caught on to it. Tom DeLonge ahead of the curve once again. Very, very like mid 2000s moment here. The sort of, she looks like she modeled for Delia's a few years ago, but now she's older. So she's like the space girl awkwardly wearing headphones in the Tom DeLonge video. What do we, what do we think about this? I would say this does hold up. I don't think this sounds dated or like, I, I think this could come out today and it would sound fresh and people would be into it. Um, you know, it's like Angels and Airways is one of those bands that's like popular yet not popular. And I don't know, it's weird. It feels like they don't have as much currency as they should, but I would say that this totally holds up. You know, the, the video is a little rough, but the song I would say is great. I think it holds up. Obviously, everybody knows this one. This is Misery Business by Paramore. Wait, here's the part I'm confused about with this video. If she is she supposed to be like another student? Because she looks like she's like 32. So I'm confused why she would be Haley's rival. Unless this is like some, you know, cougar mom that's like invaded the school to try to get all the boys' attention or something, which would be super weird. Stacy's mom, yes. Good commentary in the chat here, which I was hoping would come up. The video is iconic, I would say. Like, everyone knows this video, but like I said in the chat here, it's a weird bully revenge fantasy. You know, it's kind of it's kind of strange. Now, again, to be fair, Haley was, what, 15 or 16 or something when they did this, so um, the other thing that came up is that she has, you know, I guess basically disavowed this song because... You know, like what she, there's a line about the girl being a whore or whatever. Um, and, and I think it's cool that she did that, especially since this is one of their hit songs and she knows that it would alienate a lot of people for them to, to walk away from it. I think it's cool that she did that anyway. You know, whether you agree or disagree with her reasons for doing it, I, you know, it's not easy to tell your fans, no, I'm not going to play that song that you love because I've grown out of it. I think that's cool. I respect that. There it is. Let's look at some comments. Why is this 30-year-old woman walking around in high school bullying everybody? And and this too. Imagine in 15 years, kids are going to be listening to this and they're going to be saying, I was born in the wrong decade. Um, which probably, I'm not going to read the comments, but they they probably are. It's very interesting. You know, nobody took this band seriously at the time. Everyone thought they were just stuff, you know, like, teeny bopper bullshit the same stuff they always say about new artists you never know what's going to be considered classic in 15 years and i would say this song is a classic so as to whether this holds up i would say it does you know the song the video it's a great mix too i mean to this day the riot snare is one of those like drum mix things that everyone wants to do the video like yeah i would i would say this is a classic this song is knock me down by red hot chili peppers i actually love red hot chili peppers even though uh anthony kiedis is a cringe person, as I have learned. I guess he wrote some autobiography where he, like, is bragging about basically kidnapping a 15-year-old when he was, like, 19 or something. <laughs> so uh, I'm not on board with that. But I I did like the band a lot when I was younger. I still think they have one of the best, best rhythm sections in the game. So let's listen to this song and see if it holds up. I hate their new shit. I only like their old stuff. Will Ferrell is a great drummer. My issue with this song and video is the hats. There's some really bad headwear here. Like, we've got, we've got like a fedora. We've got one of those like, I don't know what you even call them. Those like, not a flat cap, but this is from 89, I think. A lot of bad hats. One of the best rhythm sections in the game. I mean, Chad Smith and Flea, like, say what you want about the Red Hot Chili Peppers being cringe or anything. Those two are two of the fucking best in the game. Anthony Nikita's fucking sucks as a singer. I think he's a, a good front man because he's a good-looking, charismatic guy. 
uh, with a lot of stage presence, but he's a fucking horrible vocalist. That's my biggest issue with the band is like, I just wish they had a different singer. Nobody's wearing a shirt. Does this hold up as much as, um, as much as I, I would say, no, you know, as a song, no, this does not hold up. Uh, if you're a musician and you know, you just want to appreciate the fact that flea and Chad Smith are a fucking amazing rhythm section. It holds up from that perspective, but overall I would say, no, it does not hold up. Okay. Here is a certified classic. I have a good story about this one too. Am I still, I'm still frozen though. Hmm.